Good evening, everybody. I'm going to try and uh, Zoom this meeting, so hopefully we can have a, a better interaction and figure this out a little bit more. I'm going to get better and better each week. I'm making that commitment to figure out how to interact with my family and have Bible study. Well, today we're going to be back in John chapter 1, and we're going to um, just discuss a few things there. And we're going to start with, uh, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We, we kind of addressed that last week a little bit, but this week we're going to go into depth by asking some questions. And I want you to think about this. Uh, John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I want you to answer these questions as uh, I pray and talk to God about it. But does that mean that you're sinless? And if Jesus took away all the sins of the world, then is everybody going to heaven? What does it mean to be a believer? And, and uh, how do you know that your sins are taken away? And how can you be sure that you're saved? These are important questions that the gospel writer, John, wanted to address, wants you to think about, and didn't want you to have a pat answer for. And here we are at the coronavirus, uh, heading into the peak of it at this time in the world. So let's keep that in mind as we pray. Uh, look forward to being united with you guys again. Um, enjoy enjoying Holy Week as a family in person. But right now we're going to uh, worship God in Bible study. Lord, we're not worthy to receive you. We didn't earn our salvation. We cannot ever work our way into heaven. You came down from heaven and did the work that we need, but we need to understand that it's not merely an idea or a one-time event and then we go on with our merry lives, but rather it is a, a beginning of a relationship. We were dead to you, spiritually dead, relationally from you by our sins. And just as um, we, want, we are now in social distancing with the coronavirus, sin is like that virus around you. You cannot be around it. Um, we, we bring infection with us, and we need to be healed. So, Lord, help us understand what it means to be healed by the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We pray this, Father, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May you get all the glory, honor, and power. Okay, now let's look at John chapter 1. And we have John uh, the Baptist looking at Jesus. He has done his ministry. He's pointed Israel to return to Christ, return to God, get ready for the Messiah. We talked about how he was not Elijah reincarnate, but he is the Elijah figure that has been prophesied in the Old Testament. And so the Bible tells us that in John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wow. And uh, in verse 35, he says, again, the next day, John was standing with two of the disciples, and he looked upon Jesus as he walked, and he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Now, may I ask you a very serious question? If Jesus takes away the sins of the world, are all your sins taken away? Are they all gone? And if you said, yes, they're all gone, Jim. You're, you're, I believe the Bible, uh, Jesus took away all my sins. Okay. You sure? Are you telling me that you're sinless? That you've never, once you became a Christian and Christ took away your sins, you're truly sinless? Is that what you're telling me? Many people who are even in church struggle with these concepts. Why? Because we want to make salvation merely a punctiliar or an instantaneous event, and then we're done with it. We don't want to think about the way the Bible talks about salvation. Now, I want to make this clear. The reason why many people struggle in reading the Bible is because, once again, 
they, they think um, Bible study is merely word study. Now, again, defining words are important, but if you look at a dictionary, each word you look at, you'll find multiple entries. And even with those entries, you may have five, seven, sometimes 20 different ways in which that word can be nuanced. I'll give you an example, bank. If I said bank to you, what comes to your mind? Go ahead and say some things. Now, did a, a place you go to deposit checks and money come to mind? Sure. Uh, for some of you, you may have. How many of you thought of a bank by the river where you might go fishing? Those are two very different ideas off of one word. How many of you thought of a bank shot that a, a hockey player or a basketball player might be making? What if I used an idiom like, you can bank on that? Am I telling somebody to go and cash a check? Or am I indicating that they can be confident that what I said was true? That's just one word, bank. Had multiple definitions. And even with those dictionary definitions, reading the words around it and the context and the situation can bring certain nuances to that word. And sometimes uh, the words will use uh, multiple meanings at one time. And that all comes from context. And this is, goes back to, again, they were, they were, there are people in churches, and again, I, it very, it's very confusing to me that men of God, women of God who would be teaching the Bible act as if the Bible is, a, is some mystical, magical book. And uh, certainly it, it is a revelation from God. It is, uh, it is God's majesty being revealed, but God did it in language and in human communication so that we could understand God, that we could uh, make some analogies and also have some very clear teachings about who God is. So the, the Bible in context needs to be understood. And so we need to look at the entirety of scripture. I remember Franklin Graham mentioning one time that somebody complained that he used other verses in the Bible when he preached from a passage. And he said, well, what else do you expect me to do? I want to interpret the Bible by what the Bible says about itself. And there are so many, there are many people, even the Christian denominations and churches that either look to tradition, they're feeling, or they just want to focus on one passage and they let a, a person who says they're a Bible teacher redefine words or take words from uh, an anachronistic mindset and read definitions back into the Bible that were not there. And so when we read the Bible, one of the things that we struggle with as evangelicals, in contrast to the Roman Catholics, is we struggle with only wanting to interpret sin and salvation as a one-time event. I raised my hand at a Billy Graham crusade. I came forward. I got baptized as an adult. And that's what it means to have my sins forgiven or taken away. Then we struggle with this concept of what does it mean that I keep on sinning? Where the Roman Catholics, on the other hand, they, they don't give any assurance of salvation. They tell you you have to keep on going back to the church to get grace, uh, get communion, you get some grace, go to confession, you get a little more grace that hopefully washes away and wipes away your sin. And, and Christ has enough forgiveness to take away your sin, but, it, but it's not going to be complete without you doing some things to kind of gain more, to fill your cup. As I said uh, a while back that we heard this verse, Hail Mary, full of grace, and that's the Hail Mary prayer. But it comes from the Latin interpretation of the visitation of the angel Gabriel with Mary, where the Latin version says, Oh, Hail Mary, you're full of grace. Whereas the Greek in context says, Hail Ma Mary, you are favored of the Lord. In other words, God is showing you favor, not that she had grace in herself, but God, who's, who's good and gracious, is being gracious and kind and showing favor to her. Very different concept. Again, same verse, uh, just an a inappropriate way of translating it because we know from the Bible, no human being is full of grace. When you have a, you have a, 
a verse that you kind of have this weird translation you want to focus on. So we have grace and Mary. We said people got to confuse. The Catholics want to kind of gain grace. And Protestants want to go, well, I, I got grace and I'm done. I'm, uh, Christ died for my sins and rose again. And it's all hunky-dory. I, I can't sin anymore. Or I do sin, so maybe I didn't get saved. That's a big issue when you hear a verse like this, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. That was a long introduction. And I want to now look at three broad categories of sin and what God is doing when he saves us. So if you have a notebook, you can write this in your Bible if you're comfortable. But there are three broad categories of sin. The first category of sin would be the legal guilt I incur when I do something wrong, that I have offended God's heavenly court. There's a warrant out against me for my sin. Right? If you commit a crime and the law knows you committed a crime, you are guilty of that crime. And unless you pay retribution, you make atonement, you make it right, you do your time, that warrant is valid and you are a guilty person. But we need God to take away that guilt. But then there's also the, the sin of defilement, that we are dirty because we sin. It, it ruins our character. It ruins our relationship with God and other people when we sin. That's sins of defilement. And then there's the sin of corruption that's just naturally around us. Our bodies are decaying. Our bodies are flawed. Our minds are flawed. They are decaying. And even when they are doing well, we are coming from a long line of people who are, are leaving perfection where Adam and Eve were and in harmony with God, in harmony with the environment, in harmony with each other. And then they broke down and death entered the world, Romans 5, 12. For just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. And then death spread to all people, decay spread to all people, punishment spread to all people, corruption spread to all people. Why? Because all sin, all of us rebel. So we have three aspects that sin has, has been placed in our lives. Number one, we're legally guilty before God. Number two, we're defiled in our thinking, in our, our actions and attitudes that need to be cleaned up so we behave more like God. And then three, our bodies are decaying. We need to have new bodies that no longer will decay, no longer will die, and no longer will desire to sin. So in the old way of talking about these things, there is these words that were used, and people were familiar with them in churches. The words would be justification. The other word would be sanctification, being made holy. Uh, justification would be made legally right, or righteous, legally in good standing, legally in right standing. And I said sanctification, which is holiness, living a life that uh, shuns sin and desires the good, a life of virtue. And ultimately, there's glorification. We know that can happen through translation in the rapture, as some people would refer to it. And uh, it's uh, the uh, harpazio, the, the gathering up of God's people, his children. And the glorification also means that we will have new bodies. Now, where do we get these concepts? Well, first off, we can look in Romans chapter 8, and we see a, a term there about how we don't have to uh, fear being rejected by God if we're in Christ. So it says in verse 1 of chapter 8 of Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation. That's a legal term. You can't be condemned. You can't, you can't be sentenced to jail. You can't be put away. You can't be given a death sentence. There is no condemnation for who? For those who are in Christ Jesus. You catch that? You're in 
Christ Jesus, not, oh, I met him when I was 13. Oh, I, I said yes to him with the pastor at my house, and I went to church for about six months, but then I'm doing my own thing again. No, there is a reference there to a relationship. When you are born again, you're born into God's family. You are born into a new life. You are born no longer thinking about how to please yourself, but to please the one who died and rose again on your behalf. That would be found in 2 Corinthians 5, 15. And that, that comes right before 5, 17 that says, if any man's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away, new things have come. Now, there you have the, the linking now of being justified, being born again, being a new creation legally, being a new creation spiritually. I am no longer the old man, the old woman, the old person. I am now a new person in Christ. I have a new direction, a new life. And I need to move towards the things that God has called me to move. So in Romans 8, it covers the legal side, the, the guilty side. There's no condemnation for, for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a relationship. That's a continual thing, not just a one-time event. Yes, you do immediately move from the kingdom of darkness, which is Satan's world and the sinful world, into the kingdom of the son he loves, right? It's in Colossians chapter 1. He, he rescues us from the dominion of darkness and places us. That happens right away, okay? So that's one aspect, but it's not, it's not alone. It is tied to the other three aspects of salvation. Now, here what he says, verse 2. For the law of the spirit of, of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death, right? Sin brings condemnation. There's a legal guilt. For shout what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So Jesus came in the nature of man that he would die in our place, taking care and taking away the legal guilt. And that is available to everybody in the world. There's not one person that Christ's death could not uh, take the place of. And there's not one person Christ didn't die for. There are many people, though, who refuse to receive the gift. And that's on them. That's what we'll find out in John chapter 3. So Christ takes away the sins of the world in a legal sense, but then we still struggle with the sin in our behavior as Christians. And by the way, if you're ever struggling with, man, I, I struggle with sin. I'm a Christian. Am I really a Christian? Well, if you're just a worldly person who is not spiritual at all, you don't worry about getting drunk. You don't worry about cheating. You don't worry about stealing. You really don't. You, you, you might not want to get caught, but when push comes to shove and you don't think you get caught, you're going to do what you want to do. But when you're a Christian, you have a new, a new spirit. You have a new creation and you want to follow God. And if you look in 1 John, so let's, let's go to another book written by the Apostle John. 1 John, and I can't cover all of it, but I'm going to cover uh, some key thoughts here. So 1 John chapter 1, right, verses 7. So we'll start there. We all know verse 9 oftentimes, but it says, But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light. Now, for those who? In Christ Jesus. If we walk in Jesus, by default, we would be walking with him in the light. They're unified. They're connected. If we walk with him as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, right? So Christians should be able to get along. Now, if Christians are, if someone says they're Christians, always bickering, always fighting over nothing, now I can understand an adulterer calling, hey, you're committing adultery, stop that. Hey, you murdered somebody, stop that. Hey, you're stealing, stop that. That's different than picking at other Christians. Well, I didn't get a phone call. This person 
didn't didn't uh, buy me the best gift. They didn't call me enough, or they didn't let me have this job, or you know, who I'm not going to pick up that trash. Uh, I'm not going to help out at church. I'm not going to help out my house. You know, th- those are things that Christians shouldn't be bickering about. But we will see right here that we will struggle with them, and we will we will walk in the light as a Christian, but the light will reveal that we need to clean our act up. The Bible says, we have fellowship and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So he's cleansing us in a continual sense. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So right here, there you have it right there. The Bible never says Christians live in sinless perfection. As a matter of fact, the Bible says if somebody who claims to be a Christian also claims sinless perfection, let me read that again. If we say that we have no sin, now, in one sense, Christ took away all the sins of the world, our legal guilt, but in another sense, we are still struggling to overcome the sin habits and sin nature. And so John, through the Holy Spirit, has us read this text that says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So if someone's not telling the truth, they say, ah, I'm a sinlessly perfect person, they're committing a sin right there. They just lied. (laughs) It's, it's, It's one of those things where, that there's no there's no way to correct that doctrine besides dropping that doctrine of sinless perfection. Okay, but verse nine goes on to say, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, it is a daily walk with Jesus. We are being perfected daily. When the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, it does not say work for your salvation. Work out. You can only work out that which is already in you. So when you're a born-again person, you are working out that relationship with Christ, walking in the light, and therefore you are growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. That's what the Bible says, what Peter tells people that. Continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Why? Because we are not made for this world right now with uh, the pandemic going on. Uh, People fear death, and certainly we don't want to see any more deaths than we have to. But I hope that everybody would take death seriously right now and recognize that everybody will die. We all have a fatal disease called sin, and we need God to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us, that we will be with him one day. John, uh, in the Doctrine of the Resurrection in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, Paul tells us that the resurrection is something unique. So he says, verse 51 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. That's referring to the coming of Christ where he will Uh, instantaneously resurrect people or transform people and we call it the rapture or those who are living will be transformed just like Enoch was translated and Elijah was taken to heaven without dying an earthly death death he was translated immediately in a moment in a twinkle of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall all be changed for the perishable must put on the imperishable. These, these bodies are perishable. Um, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and the mortal have, will put on the immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. So with that being said, I want you to reflect on the three aspects of sin, that there's legal guilt, there's inner defilement, uh, desires that are bad, and then there's the corruption of the world, the decay of the world, and the decay you know, of, of the spiritual realm too. There's, there's demons, there are uh, angels, angelics that have rebelled, and they are decaying. Um, they are going to lose power. They will not be able to stand in God's holy presence. But we, when we are translated and transformed into new bodies, will have a permanent residence in heaven, a permanent place with God. So that is what God is doing. He is saving us from sin and not merely from sin to do as we please. He's saving us from a dominion of darkness and selfishness, of uh, the, the powers and principalities, and also the, the morality of the world to a morality and a, a kingdom of God that we would walk with him. God is saving us from sin and selfishness unto himself. Many people think that heaven's a, a place where you go on vacation, that we will simply be separate from God. That is not true. The goal of God's salvation is that we walk with him and live with him forever. So talk about those tonight uh, with your friends or even with me. If you want online, you can interact a little bit. I'll try to do my best to discuss that. Now I want to go, go back to John chapter 1. Let's look at John chapter 1 and move beyond that. We saw the, the Andrew there, right? So let's see what happens. So they see, they see the Lamb of God, and we find that Andrew uh, follows the, the Messiah. And he looks at him, and it says, uh, he looked at him, and Jesus turned and beheld, in verse 38, them following, and he said, what do you seek? And they said, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come, and you will see. They came, therefore, and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated means the Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which translated means Peter. Isn't that great? And what we see is what's called the Andrew principle. Andrew did not have all the answers, but Andrew pointed Peter to Jesus. And that made all the difference. Sometimes we as Christians think that in order to see a person come to Christ, we have to have all the answers. First off, it's better if you don't know for sure. Just say, I don't know. But I do know Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I met him. He died for me. You have your testimony. You know that you met Christ. You know that you are a believer. You know that you have forgiveness with God. And you can share those stories. There are things that people believe about the Bible. And an example being, we watched a, a show uh, on YouTube, I think the chosen one. And uh, the kids asked, well, was Mary Magdalene a prostitute? And somebody in my family said, well, yeah, she was. I said, no, she wasn't. Well, yeah, she, no, it's, it's in the Bible, isn't it, Jim? No, it's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. Matter of fact, uh, Mary Magdalene, the only thing we know about her is that she was demon-possessed. Christ healed her. She was one of the main followers of Christ early on. And she supplied a lot of the financial need. She was a giver. So she was a lady of means. And I can guarantee you that she was not prostituting herself when uh, she was following Jesus. So she had a business or she had money or she had a fame that was wealthy. She just had a really bad experience with demons. That's all we know about her. There's a lot of legends that came around her, and there's reasons those legends built up, uh, but they weren't because of biblical witness. They were more because of um, theological hobby horses. I don't want to get into them, but there, there you have, again, um, ideas that float in the Bible about what it means to follow Jesus. 
She just simply pointed people to Jesus. She was the first witness of the resurrection. Same as Andrew. All he knew was that Jesus made a difference in his life. Jesus was everything that was prophesied. Things were going on around Jesus that were clearly indicative of him being the Lamb of God. And John the Baptist clearly was a prophet. And so Andrew shared what he knew. You know more than enough to tell somebody Jesus died for their sins and rose again. You don't have to be an expert on Genesis chapter 1 or Ezekiel or Isaiah or Revelation. You just need to know Jesus and to share him. That's all Andrew did. And he invited Peter. And Peter invited people. And the disciples grew. That is the power. Just as we see the negative power of the coronavirus right now, COVID-19, that it spreads so rapidly. I'd prefer that the coronavirus be stopped and that more Christians spread the good news and more people got infected with the message of Christ, and the Christ, the resurrection, life, and not death. And that we see the world is full of death. The virus is a physical form of death. But the lust of the flesh, the desires to do things your own way, avoiding God, avoiding his worship, avoiding his morality, avoiding reading his Bible, those are spiritual sicknesses that lead to death. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 3, there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is death. We want to follow that. We want to be like uh, Andrew, who found first his brother, his own family, and shared the Messiah with them. So that's the great news. And they become a Christian. Well, in uh, John chapter 2, verse 23 to 25, I just want to Look at this verse, these three verses, and think about this as we close. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. Remember John chapter 112. But to as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believed in his name. So they've got believing in his name right. Right? This is the disciples here. So, It says, many believed in his name, beholding his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to bear witness concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. So it's talked about the three aspects of salvation. I mentioned John 1.12, but to as many as received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We just read John chapter 2, verse 23. I just covered the sins of the world and the three aspects of sin, right? And he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And here's a question. Read this again. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name, beholding his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need witness to bear witness concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. These people said the right thing. I believe in Jesus. I raise my hand. I'm confident. I believe once saved, always saved. I'm going to heaven. I got my name in a Bible. I got a picture of me being baptized. So read that verse again. Where are these people who believed in his name, having watched the wonders and signs, were they saved from their sins? Were they truly in God's family? I would say that's not a question that we have to struggle with because Jesus answers it. John answers it. In order to be saved, you have to be in Christ. In order to be saved, it's a relationship. Jesus was not entrusting himself to them. There's something false about the profession. They may have been convinced that they believed in Jesus, but their belief was flawed in some way. 
They believed about Jesus. They believed in something Jesus did, but they didn't believe in him. They hadn't received him fully. They liked the idea of going to heaven. They liked the idea of following the Messiah. They liked the idea of being religious. But there is something that Jesus, who knows the heart and mind and soul, that looked at them and said, what's in them is not faith in me. What's in them is not a relationship. Now, where do you fall in your walk with God? Are you the type of person where if I asked you, well, do you think that you are going to heaven right now? And did you ever, have you ever doubted your salvation? You go, oh, I never doubted my salvation. I belong to a church that teaches once saved, always saved. And as a baby, I went there and I, I got baptized. But really, your life may even conform in some ways outwardly to the religious aspects of being a Christian, a Baptist, a Methodist, a Catholic, a Presbyterian, an independent church type person. But your heart has never really been with Jesus. You might fear God. You might fear God. You, just, you obey because you won't get punished. But do you really love God? The Bible says true love uh, takes away all fear. Do you have a relationship with Jesus that's a loving relationship, a forgiven relationship, a transforming relationship? That's an important question. I would also say then, on the other hand, are you fearful of your salvation constantly? Do you constantly worry about every little sin that you committed? Uh, have you looked at 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 through 9 closely? Maybe you're under conviction but you're a child of God, and you need to work on talking to God and cleaning up known areas of sin in your life that are hindering you from walking with God. Perhaps you're stingy. You're not a giver. You don't give faithfully to your church. You don't, you don't go on a mission trip. You don't want to serve. You don't want to be tied down to helping others grow in Christ. You, you know, one of the reasons why I believe everybody should be a teacher in a church, whether it's with children teenagers or adults, everybody should rotate into teaching positions at some point. Maybe you don't take it forever, but you become a, a solid assistant teacher. You help out at BBS. You help out on mission trips. You help train uh, other people. Is because you grow when you teach. Because teaching puts you in a position where you have to study and think about things and be prepared. Showing up, anybody can show up. But if you have to teach, you have to prepare. So Maybe you need to step up to the plate and God's been working on you that way. So I would just challenge you to go back and read 1 John uh, 1, 9 and recognize there are sins of commission, doing wrong things, and omission, not doing the right thing. What did James say? He who knows the good thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So maybe the reason you struggle with uh, feeling confident in your salvation, that you're not really walking with Jesus the way you should be. You're not walking in the light. You're, you're wandering in the light, but you're not walking in the light. So I want to challenge you to read First John, but also look in your heart. Have you truly trusted Christ to forgive all your sins? Have you truly placed yourself in his hands? And are you looking forward to being glorified with him? Let's pray. Father, I pray right now that all of these people who hear this word, that your spirit reach out to them. Convince those who have believed in your name and have received you that they are your children that they can have confidence, not in the flesh, but confidence in your word and your promise. You never lie. Lord, I pray for those right now who struggle with wondering how could God love them, that they understand what it means when John says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. They'd also understand your desire to clean them up, but they have to surrender the areas of sin that they're struggling with in their life to follow you, and Lord, many times that Christians will not feel comfortable in sin and will confuse that with not having salvation rather than not living right and having the Lord discipline us. Lord, help us to understand your chastisement versus your um, cursing. But Lord, I pray for those who are far from you. They are close to you physically. They're around the things of the Bible, but they have not truly trusted you. There's something flawed in their relationship with you, their relationship to what the Word of God says, that their eyes be opened that they would hear the word of God and they truly believe in you and receive you in their lives. 
Now, Father, I pray your mighty hand to be upon all people that we come into contact, that we just point them to Jesus like Andrew did, that we would be the chain, uh, a healthy link in the chain of salvation, that many would believe in the Christ who is Jesus and the power of his resurrection, not only to forgive sin, but to give us new life. We praise you for the resurrection. We praise you for the glorification. Amen. And with that, I would just uh, have you write down the name of a person you might want to share your faith with, if you like an Andrew. I also want to challenge you to explain to a family member right now, tonight, the three aspects of sin, the three aspects of what God is saving us for, you know, condemnation. We're guilty before God. So therefore, God has to legally forgive us. The Lamb of God died for us. Then there's also the the need for being made holy, being cleansed, 1 John 1, 9. Uh, we need to be cleansed daily, but also the glorification of 1 Corinthians 15, that we will have new bodies, new life. Talk about those three aspects of sin, you know, the sin that is guilt, the sin that is inner corruption, right? And the sin that's outward corruption, the inner corruption is at heart and, and they're being desiring for things that are bad, wanting to, to become virtuous. And, and then also I would say, um, read John three and four for, for the next few weeks. We're gonna keep, keep on camping out for a little bit. And then uh, memorize John one twelve. Get whatever version you have, get it word for word, letter for letter and ponder it. Uh, it's believing and receiving. Again, uh, there could be someone who has a gift for you. And they say, wrap it up. And they say, I have a gift for you. And you say, I, I say, it's a gift. I agree it's a gift. And they can say, I paid for it. And it's, and it's free to you. And you can agree with them all day long about it's a gift. But until you take that gift and you receive that yourself, you don't have the gift. So read that verse, John 1, 12. For those who believed in his name, for those who received him. See how God Combine those two actions, believing and receiving. And memorize that verse and think about it the next week or so and talk about it with your friends. God bless you. Good talking to you. And hopefully we'll have some good discussion. Take care.